Well, hey, everyone, and welcome to episode number 44 of The Other Six Podcast. My name is Chad Boak, and I'm your host. Joining me once again in the studio, my co-host, our worship pastor, and author of the historic fiction novel set in the Garden of Eden about Adam entitled, I'm Fallen and I Can't Get Ups, <laughs> Matt Collins. Matt, how are you today, sir? <laughs> I'm good. Doing good, man. Yeah, Doing he good. can't play basketball in the Garden of Eden. Yeah. That's, why he's, that's why he can't get ups. Yeah, yeah get so I appreciate up, that. Yeah. And uh, also yeah. joining us in the studio, our Did lead pastor, Adam Bishop. Adam, how are you today, sir? I just like listening to Matt laugh. It right? makes me happy. Yeah. So thank you for making Matt laugh. Yeah, so. That's what I'm here for. And I still don't know how on earth you come up with these. It really is a gift. Yeah, you know. You should figure out how to monetize. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think this podcast is accomplishing that. Pro- probably not. Probably not. If that's it is, okay. you haven't let us in on it. Yeah, well, well that's... <laughs> yeah. well, how are you guys doing today? Everybody have a good weekend? Yeah, yeah. I ran into Matt at Target this weekend. Did you really? Yeah. And yeah. we went shopping together. Yeah. It was yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, we did not do that. But I was there with uh, Morgan and Henry, and there was Matt, and he was in Target. And it's yeah. kind of like, you know, when you're a kid and you see your school teacher somewhere yeah. other than the school, yeah, it's like, like they have a life outside of here. It's like, Matt, it's I, didn't so know weird. You, I didn't know you did you stuff other than work at the church. church. Right, right, right. <laughs> so it was yeah. fun to run into Matt at Target, which, by the way, that's the place to be on a Saturday. Yes, it oh is. Everyone's God. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody. Now I realize why D never goes on Saturday. Right? Yeah, yes. our wives are a lot smarter yeah, than yeah. us when it comes to those things. But we got some rain, yeah. Yeah. which was fantastic. Yeah. It hadn't rained in forever. So, Dude, uh, it was needed. Yes. Well, it's coming like all next week. Hallelujah. So we need some rain. I got three of my trees. The leaves are turning like it's fall <laughs> yeah and i'm like am i supposed to water that it's one thing to water flowers you're a tree, tree. Right, 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 right. yeah so yeah. I'm, I'm i'm hoping we get more rain but we got a little this weekend yeah. so that was fun yeah. what'd you do this weekend well so this past week my in-laws have been off camping you know chris and i both work so we didn't get the opportunity to go and unbeknownst to me we uh we i say we because apparently i agreed to this as well signed up to dog sit so i get home Last week from church, and here comes Vader, here comes Brandy, and then here comes Augie. And I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> I don't know this dog. So, uh, yeah, they, they would greet me every single morning, all three of them on the couch looking at me. So we do- got to dog sit this week. That do they get along? They got along great. That's they good. They had a great time. There were no fights. There were no issues. Good. Uh, you know, there, there were a few accidents, but uh, that's we don't have to talk too much yeah. about that. That was just chat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, it was a... Right. <laughs> That's right. But it was, no, it was good. We got puppy trained. That's right. We got the dog set. So it was good having, you know, shout out to Augie. Thanks for uh, hanging out. I couldn't remember his name for the longest time. I kept calling him Argyle. And uh, apparently that was wrong. So does Augie. Does Augie respond to Argyle? No, Augie did not respond to Argyle. You're like, yeah, yeah, he's dog. not listening. Yeah, Those are names. Yeah. 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 Smart animals. Yeah, so it was good. But yeah, yeah. and then uh, this weekend, I got to hang out with the students kind of for the first time upstairs, which was really a lot of fun. You know, we had our big pool party last weekend on Wednesday night. I had a bunch of folks show up. And then, uh, you know, with you know Justin moving on to be a lead pastor, I'm kind of getting to hang out with the students. And we had a great time this morning. We played some Would You Rather. You know, oh. <laughs> yeah. So the whole thing we talked about was like, you know, how the Holy Spirit helps us love others. So as an example of how sometimes we can have disagreements, I put them into groups and made them come up with their answer for these would you rather questions. So things like, would you rather... I was about to say, you've got to yeah, have one gotta, for me and sure, Matt now. Yeah. Sure. So would you rather not be able to talk or be constantly interrupted every time you talked? Oh, not, not talk, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I I have to talk. Right. That's so, your job. Yeah, right. I mean, right, right. The interruption, I would yeah, just have yeah. to put up with. I can't imagine not being able to talk. Right. Or yeah. would you would you rather have right. a permanent mustache or a permanent unibrow that looks like a mustache? Oh, the stash. <laughs> the right. Stash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come sure, on, yeah. man. What I was surprised by was how many girls actually chose that. Like all the guys were like, <laughs> I'll take the mustache. But the girls were like, give me a mustache. I don't want a unibrow. So <laughs> that's like the worst possible thing they right, have right, a right. unibrow. And then uh, yeah. one of the ones that I'm sure most of our parents don't, it was, would you rather never wear jeans again or have to dress like your parents for the rest of your life. And they went with this whole loophole of like, well, my dad always wears jeans. So that way I'd get to wear my jeans. I don't know. It was kind of an interesting. Yeah, Yeah, that's a complex question. So so, Sam was in there. Do you remember how he answered that one? uh, I think that I had to sign some NDA with Sam. I'm I'm (laughs) I'm pretty sure his dad's a pretty amazing dresser. That's right. uh, No, he said that it was awesome. (laughs) Well, it was I was like, did you guys have fun on Sunday morning? He's like, yeah, Chad killed it. So uh, it sounds like you guys had a great time. That's awesome. Yeah, and then this Wednesday night, we got like our movie night and we've been playing a bunch of fun stuff for this. So, like, I'm just telling you guys, student ministry that's it's where, where it's you want to be yeah, 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 yeah. Fun. so yeah. if you're listening and you're looking for an amazing place to serve yeah student ministry, student ministry. Oh, it's a great place so to be. what movie uh so we're watching spider-man into the spider-verse rated pg do, do we, do we, i haven't yeah. seen that one it's uh it's the cartoon the last spider-man out. i saw was toby keith was <laughs> toby mcguire mcguire <laughs> toby <laughs> keith <laughs> that's toby keith the spider-man movie. i knew yeah. it was one of those toby's yeah, of those. toby yeah. mac yeah, toby yeah, keith yeah, toby mcguire is he not is he the spider-man now 
Mm, well, yeah. That's a complicated answer. Very, I have yeah. no yeah. interest in talking about that. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah. it sounds like the movie, the cartoon is yeah, what you're it's, watching. It's yeah. a cartoon based around not anyone that you've seen in any of the Marvel movies right. or anything like that. And well, it's a. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> all right, well, we'll stick with yeah, that. So it's going to be it's fun. Amazing. We're going to have popcorn, candy, sodas, all that kind of stuff for the kids. So we're going to get them like hyped up on sugar and carbs. And then, and then oh, hyped home. up on Mountain Dew. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so anyway, it's, but it's, it's fun. It's fun. I had a good time getting to hang out that's with great. them. So, and then uh, worship was fantastic this past week. Matt, the team, fantastic job. Yeah, Adam, awesome. the message. Yeah. Uh, kind of tackled some pretty tough yeah. topics this past week. <laughs> yeah. And so I kind of, I guess we'll, we'll kind of start off there kind of with our conversation today because man, we've got some stuff to unpack today. You know, you started out your message talking about the recent decision that came out this past week with Supreme Court, Roe v. Wade kind of being overturned. And I feel like there are so many folks that feel caught in the crossfire on this subject. Mm. You know, there's so many extreme views either one way or the other. So Adam, let me just throw the question out there for you. As followers of Christ, who believe what the Bible says, want to do what the Bible says to do, what should our reaction to this news be? Well, I, yeah, I took probably 10 minutes at the beginning of the sermon and yeah. talked about it. So we're going to clip that yeah. and put it in the shout out. Okay. Uh, we'll, can you post a 10 minute video on social media? Yeah, I have absolutely. no idea. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, this is why the two like of that. you know it'll how be on, this stuff It'll works. be on our Facebook page so, and yeah, a link to our YouTube we'll, channel. We'll, yeah. we'll put the message out there. Um, if you weren't able to join us online or be here on campus, um, I wanted to take some time to unpack that biblically, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and we'll circle back around to that. Um, I also wanted our church to know this isn't something that we're just now going to start getting involved yeah. in. Yeah, We've been walking alongside um, individuals who are walking through the the fear and the anxiety of an unplanned pregnancy since this church started. Yeah, yeah. So that's always been a part of, of who we are as a church. But if you're asking me how we are to respond as Christ followers, I think we respond with immense joy. Hmm. Um, you know, I understand that that this doesn't mean it's over, that this right. is now a decision that can be made at the state level. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, I impact Psalm 139. There's lots of scripture that would lead us to the conclusion that life begins at conception, that God actually knew us before he ever formed us, That's right. yeah. that there's never been an unplanned pregnancy from God's perspective, yeah, that yeah, every yeah. life has a purpose, every life has meaning. We believe in the sanctity of life. We believe that every child should have the right to live their life. What, what's happened for the last 50 years is that those individuals have had no voice. Hmm. So part of what we have seen as the call upon our lives is to be a voice to those who have no voice, to speak up for the oppressed. And, and the one part of our society that still had no voice in any type of legal matters were the unborn child, right. which is why we speak up for them. And ultimately, what someone has to wrestle with, if this is an issue that maybe they look at differently than I do, is they have to wrestle with the issue of what authority do they think we have when it comes to determining who lives and who dies. Mm. So our laws are already incongruent. Mm. Our laws are already made up of nothing but inconsistencies. For example, if you have an auto accident, and unfortunately, let's say you strike another vehicle and that person were to pass away, Mm. we know that as vehicular homicide. So manslaughter is where there's intent. Vehicular homicide is you were driving, you were breaking the law, you hit another car, that individual passed away. You're now going to be held liable through the letter of the law. There will be all types of court proceedings. You'll have to get a lawyer. And unfortunately, that would be a terrible thing to have to go through. If you hit a, a vehicle and the person who was driving that vehicle was a female who was pregnant and she died and therefore the pregnancy ending, you would be charged with a uh, double vehicular homicide. Mm. You'd be charged with killing two people. Mm. So our laws are already set up to say that that is a life that you are held liable for if you kill the mother in an automobile accident, Mm. but yet not if you were to go into an abortion clinic and choose. So what our laws have done is they've elevated man slash woman, mankind, to a place of determining who lives and who doesn't. Mm. And... That's just unfathomable right. to me. Um, I do believe that human history will look back on these 50 years with great horror mm-hmm. that we legalized this at a federal level for 50 years. And I think that people, we talk all the time about wanting to be on the right side of history. Mm-hmm. I want to be on the right side of the present, mm-hmm. but I also want to be on the right side of history. Right. If you want to be on the right side of history on this one, this is the right call. Mm-hmm. 
this is the right call. And we can unpack all of the legal, you know, things. And, and there's a whole case to be made there that maybe yeah. we'll circle back around it sometime. And I'm pretty passionate about this because uh, for many years, I thought this was going to be a major part of what I did with my life. Hmm. So um, I did debate and I did, you know, all the things with that. Um, the issue of abortion and my take on it is actually what got me a scholarship on the debate team in college. Oh, really? Um, yeah, that's a whole story in and of itself. But yeah. I uh, did a debate on campus and won the debate. And the debate coach said, hey, why don't you join the team? So I, I've been arguing for the right to life for the unborn child basically since I was in middle school right. to anybody uh, who right. would listen. Yeah. Wow. And so uh, and, and, and so have many others. <clears throat> right. But we've always done it with kindness and with grace towards individuals who see this differently than us, right. but never backing down because we believe that they do have the right to life. Right. Another interesting thing to do, if you really want to, you know, maybe someone's out there, you see this differently. Um, you know, I, I can, we can respectfully have a conversation about that. I would encourage you to look up a letter from a Birmingham jail by Martin Luther King Jr., which was written, interestingly enough, to white clergy um, who kept telling Dr. King to wait. The time isn't right. And this is where he famously says, it's always the right time to do the right thing. Mm. But if you read Letter from a Birmingham Jail, and every time you read about the oppression that black Americans were facing in the Jim Crow legislation of the South, if you were to replace that with the unborn child, you have before you an amazing piece of literature advocating for the rights of those who have no rights. Wow. So this is not a new argument. It's just one that we up until Friday, had not applied yeah. to unborn children in our country. Right. So what does that mean? Practically speaking, we partner with crisis pregnancy centers, adoption agencies, fostering uh, ministries. We're going to ratchet that up to a new level. Right. We're going to have a greater level of commitment and generosity at a, as a church um, to come alongside individuals who are walking through the season. We partner with a ministry here locally that's a crisis pregnancy center, and I went to a dinner that they had a couple years ago. It was right before COVID, and Daniel Atkins, who pastors Taylor Road Baptist yeah. Church, Daniel was emceeing the event. It was yeah. a fantastic event. And the keynote speaker for that event was someone who his mom had gotten pregnant when she was a college student. And no, 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 I'm, I'm getting that right. I'm getting that wrong. I apologize. He, the keynote speaker, he and his girlfriend had, uh, she had gotten pregnant when they were in college. Okay. And um, he was shocked in that season. And he's in his fifties now. So this was a long time ago that they were just told, well, abort the child. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. like they didn't have a choice. They chose not to do that, obviously. And they kept the baby and the child is now has like an earned PhD degree. And he did a fantastic job with the keynote, but he said something that, I've never forgotten, and I didn't want to say it from the stage because without a little bit of context, it, it, it could land almost uh, confusing, sure. so I can say it on the podcast because yeah. we can yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah. He said, never forget the center of our faith is an unplanned pregnancy, <laughs> and when wow. he said that, <laughs> it, it got me. Yeah. So we get it. The circumstances are a little different, right? Right. Yeah. But the fear and the anxiety that Mary was feeling when she found out you're pregnant yeah. with the Son of God, the conversations she has with Gabriel, the conversations that Gabriel has to have with Joseph, we actually have at the center of our faith a template for walking through life with individuals who are going through an unplanned pregnancy, hmm. both the mother and and the Father right. in a way where we can graciously and lovingly show compassion, kindness, care, leading them to a conclusion other than ending the pregnancy. Right. This is actually a part of our story. Right. You know, so yeah. I think part of what we have to do as a church is lean into that. Mm. You know, we don't advocate positions. We love people. Right. Yeah. And sometimes in our advocating of positions in the past, the church has pushed people away. Yeah. We yeah. don't want to do that. And yeah. this season, we're grateful this ruling has been made, but we see it as a greater opportunity to love people. Yeah. And that's what we're going to try to do at Vaughn Forest in this season and moving forward. But it is a significant event. Yeah. yeah. A absolutely. significant yeah, yeah. event that we're not just going to brush by and not take some time to talk about. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think you touched on a couple of these, but um, for those that are listening, w what can we do to better live out our faith regarding this subject? Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to that. You know, there's so many cell phones that ring <laughs> that Matt has. Uh, no, that's fine. There's, uh, there's so Sorry. many uh, different positions, you know, that people get angry, they get frustrated. So, you know, how do we react towards others? Is the best way of doing it posting angry memes on Facebook? Or like, what, what is it that we should yeah, be doing when we encounter folks, yeah. especially that believe differently than we do? Yeah. 
I mean, I can only lead my friend to Jesus. Mm. Yeah. Not my enemy. Mm. I, I can't anger my way to the cross. Um, Jesus said, pray for your enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. Um, if you see someone on social media or in person, honestly, social media, probably everybody should take a break. Right. Yeah. Just take right. a break. Take a breather. Just, Just follow down for us. That's all you need to do. You yeah. know, and I'm not Just trying to sound on snarky on when I say this, but it'll probably come across as snarky. So sure. I'll apologize in advance. But on Friday when this happened, I immediately I saw a lot of people tweeting things and I kind of felt like pressure. Like, yeah. am I supposed to tweet something? Yeah. And then, you know, I told myself. I'm not a tweeter. I'm a preacher. Right. I'm going to preach about this on mm, Sunday. Right. You know, we, we are so quick to fire off statements and act like, well, now I've done. No, this is a long-term process of loving people. Yeah. So yeah. if we're in it for the long haul, I'll give up the right to be right today. Mm-hmm. I'll love this person. Sure. You know, I, I want to engage this person in dialogue and in conversation and in love, right. and I want to lead them to Jesus. Right. That takes some time. If, I, if all I'm interested in is being right in the moment, I'm probably going to burn the bridge that I could have eventually walked them over to get them to the cross. Yeah. So you got to show a lot of grace. you got to show a lot of compassion. you got to mm-hmm. show a lot of kindness. And, um, you know, th- it, this is not going to be something that that people are going to just accept lightly. Sure. And so maybe for a second, try to love them through that, I guess. Right. right. I mean, that's about the best we can do in any situation. Right. Yeah. It's 50 so, years, you're not going to be able to win someone over in, what was it, 250 characters? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah like, right. it's a 50-year pro- like, yeah, like That's right. It's not going to be able to do that. That's right. So, you know, shifting gears a little bit, your, uh, your title of your message this past week was The Danger of Misinterpretation. Mm. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I kind of want to start talking about the message a little bit more there. So I hear people, you know, accuse scripture of being, you know, how, how do you know that it's accurate? How do you know that things haven't been misinterpreted? How do we know that what's written there is what was originally intended? So I guess I would ask you, kind of kicking off this conversation, talking about misinterpretation, A, how do we find a good translation and accurate a, a interpretation of scripture? And then how can we have confidence that it is accurate? The foundation of our faith is not a book. The foundation of our faith is an event called okay. the resurrection. Hmm. So let's start there. Yeah. So, you know, people who have not come to grips with the reality of the resurrection, that's step one. Right. So, you know, until someone has gotten to a place where they recognize I'm a sinner in need of a savior, this story is not like unicorns and bedtime stories. Right. <laughs> like this really happened. Right. right. And I'm going to accept <laughs> Jesus Christ as my savior. It is then you receive the Holy Spirit who wrote the Bible through these individuals. Mm. So let's not get it out of order. You know, I think we've got to get people to faith in Jesus Christ first. To expect a non-believer to believe anything in the Bible says is a little ridiculous. Oh, man. Okay, yeah. so so let's let's not get too hung up on that. So I always start with the, with Jesus. So if you study 1 Corinthians chapter 15 with integrity, don't approach it with a predetermined agenda, read it historically, what you will find is the greatest case for a historical figure that we have in all of human literature, more so than Alexander the Great, more so than Mm. other folks who were taught historically, factually true. Right. Now, whether or not you choose then to believe by faith this is the way to God, that's a separate discussion. But the idea that there's not evidence that what we believe is true, Mm -hmm. that's just, it's an irrational thought. It's all there, okay? Right. Right. So everything that I base my interpretation of Scripture on starts and ends with Jesus. Mm. So I believe the Bible is true because Jesus said it was true. Mm. I believe Jonah sat in the belly of a well for three days because Jesus said he sat in the belly of a well for three days. You walk out of a tomb after three days, I'm team Jesus. (laughs) Whatever you (laughs) say, say, I'm with. That is the foundational apologetic for why we can interpret Scripture accurately and with boldness. What Where does its authority come from? Sure. So once we establish that, now we have to move to the practices I shared in my sermon about how to do that appropriately. Right. So it has authority, not because I say it has authority, it has authority because Jesus says authority. Mm. And we have evidence that he's actually alive. Yeah. Okay. So then we want to make sure that we read it and we interpret it and understand it accurately instead of trying to make it say something we want it to say. Sure. Yeah. So you talked about the difference between uh, let me get these words right. Exegesis and eisegesis. Um, for those that weren't here, 
what what's the difference between the two, and wh- why does that matter? Yeah, well, exegesis is just when you <clears throat> interpret it accurately, mm-hmm. appropriately. Eisegesis is when you impose your own thoughts, beliefs, opinions, agendas onto it, <laughs> okay. or take verses out of script out of context to make them say something yeah. they were never meant to say. Yeah, yeah. And so, there's a lot of people that have reached unbiblical conclusions from the Bible, mm-hmm. simply because that passage was being taught eisegetically <laughs> rather than exegetically. Yeah. And I don't like to use fancy words, but I think it's important every now and then to yeah. to say them and say what they mean so that if, if folks encounter them, they at least have some type of basis, you know, the, right. the, the yeah. cool form. So if you forget, exegesis is good. It I has said, Jesus no. in it. <laughs> and they both have Jesus they in it. They both have Jesus. It's spelled differently. Eisegesus is bad. Exa good. You know, Isa good, good interpretation. <clears throat> excuse me. Good interpretation versus bad interpretation. Interpretation. Right, right. Okay. Exa good, yeah. Isa bad. There you go. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about how, you know, Isa Jesus has resulted in heretical teachings, cults, and then you also talked about some of the other contemporary, you know, consequences of Isa Jesus. You know, basically these people use scripture to justify their point. They take the scripture and they say, oh yeah, this, you know, they take it out of context, whatever it may be, to promote what they're trying to say. So same sort of question that we asked a little bit earlier about scripture. How can we know if someone is properly and correctly and faithfully delivering the word of God. What is our responsibility when someone gets up on a stage? How do we know that what they're saying is correct to us? Before I answer that, let me tell you something really random. Mm -hmm. So I had six things, right? Contemporary consequences of eisegesis. Uh So when I was working on that message on Tuesday, the sixth thing I typed out to put on that slide, and I don't remember the exact wording, so give me a little grace here, but it was something to the effect of a misunderstanding of our own individual rights, which leads me to the conclusion that um, that an unborn child doesn't have sanctity of life. And as I prayed over it after I, I wrote it, I, I felt like I felt impressed upon the Holy Spirit that if you put that up there as the sixth reason, that's the only thing anybody's going to remember about the sermon. Right. Because right, that's yeah. a, so I changed because there's more than six. Sure. So I, yeah. I, I took it out. <laughs> and then on Friday, this happens. Yeah. So I ended up, it's like the Holy Spirit was already like getting that yeah. going. God it's said, like, no, no, you will talk about yeah, it. Yeah, you're just going to talk <laughs> yeah, about it right. in a different way. So right. sometimes yeah. it's like, wow, how the Holy Spirit works. That's yeah. cool. Um, I love the church in Berea, the Berean church. They, they're commended. Not a lot of churches in the New Testament get commended. Right. <laughs> so Paul commends the, the church in Berea because they were constantly checking teachings against Scripture. Yeah. That's what everybody should do. Don't ever take something I tell you at face value. You check it to what God's word says. You're supposed to do that with anybody that you place yourself under anybody's teaching. It's your responsibility to take what they're teaching and go to God's word. You don't need a teacher to teach you God's word. Part of what I hope the calling of my life produces is fruit that helps people walk in their walk with the Lord. But in no way am I like some Bible expert that's figured everything out and and everyone has to sit under my teaching. That's not how it works. So anybody that teaches you the Bible, take what they're teaching you and you go to God's word. And if what they're teaching you doesn't match up with God's word, you need to find you a new Bible teacher. Mm -hmm. Now, Chad, if I could, just for a minute, it's amazing to me how low that is on most people's priority list of where they choose to go to church. A lot of people choose to go to church for what it can do for them. Mm -hmm. It's all about me, 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 what I like and what I don't like. And on some level, isn't whether or not the truth of God's words being delivered, isn't that kind of really important? Right. Mm -hmm. So I I think it's incumbent upon believers to let that be what guides you. If you're sitting under the teaching of God's word and that individual is walking with the Lord and they're not disqualifying themselves from ministry— probably the best thing to do is jump on board, get involved in the mission and start reaching people. You know, Mm -hmm. that's actually what the church is supposed to be about. Now here at Vaughn Forest, we're so blessed because that's all the people we have here at Vaughn Forest. (laughs) So it makes this place go, right? So we're really grateful, but I've been a part of some places that wasn't always the case. All right. So yeah, you've got to take what you're hearing and you've got to go to God's word and you've got to say, all right, I'm equipped. I have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. I have tools. I have resources. I don't need a degree. I have everything I need to discern whether or not what I'm sitting under is actually biblically accurate. Right. And if someone is violating a foundational principle of God's word, you need to find somebody else to sit under. Sure. Mm-hmm. If somebody sees a secondary or a third issue that's not centered to our faith, a little different than you, that's probably called just church. Right. You know, yeah. We're not yeah, going to yeah, right. see everything the same way. Yeah, yeah. But foundationally, you know, you should be sitting under the teaching of someone who is accurately teaching God's word. Yeah. You know? So 
let's talk for just a minute because I know how seriously you take your preparation in delivering God's word, you know, to the mm-hmm. church. I, I know people ask me, they say, do you get nervous when you preach? And I go, yeah, but not for the reason that you think. It's because I don't want to, you know, mess mm-hmm. this up. Talk to me a little bit just real quick about how important that is to you and, and the process you go through to make sure you are faithfully delivering God's word there. <laughs> I mean, we only have one podcast. So, right, you know, sure. <laughs> I mean, you asked the question. Sure. So I'm going to answer it to the best of my ability, sure. but it could seem like I'm being self-serving in this answer. I'm not. Right. Okay. I'm just, but, you know, I've been doing this for 22 years. It's only in the last six years that I've been the primary communicator of God's Word every single Sunday. Hmm. So for 16 years, you know, I was preparing. Now, I still taught every now and then. Sure. I still taught students, and I would still teach, you know, eight to ten times a year on a Sunday, kind of like you. You teach right. here at Vaughn Force, so it's not that I wasn't teaching. But, you know, I've spent years in preparation. Like, I have two master's degrees in this. I teach at two Christian universities. Um I have people in my life who I check in with about things. If I'm wondering about an accurate interpretation, I read constantly. I spend right. hours and hours and I, I wrestle, I struggle, I pray, I, I'm up at night. I mean, like this is an all consuming calling that right. ultimately I'm, I love everybody. I'm not accountable to what people tell me in the lobby on a Sunday. Now, I appreciate your, your, your kind words. Right. I'm going to be held accountable one day by the Lord. Mm-hmm. That's, that's a very serious thing. Yeah. That, that's yeah. not something that I approach lightly. I'm not going to get up there and say something on a whim. Right. I'm not going to give you a hot take. You know, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to yeah. teach you what God's Word says. Right. And I've put in thousands and thousands and thousands of hours because that calling, I, there's a weight that goes with that. Right. So, um, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm not, I, I, you know, God called me into this and he's gifted me, but the moment I start acting like an idiot and disqualify myself, like this is, this isn't about me. Right. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So this yeah. is what he's called me to do. And I humbly try to do that through his strength and his power. But the moment I think, well, I've got this figured out, right. you know, it's next up, yeah. you know, yeah. does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I, I try really, really hard. And, and, and Chad, there are books of the Bible. I'm not ready to teach yet. Mm-hmm. I know that. You know, if I get another 30 years in full-time ministry, which is my, you know, how old am I now? I don't know, if I get another 25, <laughs> I'm getting older, Chad. You know, maybe I'll get to a place where I feel like, okay, you're ready. Right. Like you, you know, one of my, I want to preach through the book of Hebrews. Mm-hmm. I've written papers about it. I've studied it. I've read everything I can. It would take a long time. I'm just not ready yet. Mm-hmm. There's just too much complexity that I'm still working through. So I'm never going to get up and teach something unless I, right. you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So yeah, it, it's a lifelong journey that I am I love, but I take it seriously. Right. You know, people say, is it fun? I don't know if that's the word I would use. Right. Um, there, there's there's a blessing in it. There's fruit that comes from it. It's rewarding, but it's a lot of work. Yeah. And, and it's work that I gladly, gladly step into. But yeah, it, it's a high calling. And then let me say this. I mean, the circles I run in with other pastors, Pastors, all of them are the same way. Hmm. I mean, Mark Bethia, First Baptist Montgomery, yeah. same thing. Daniel Atkins, Taylor Road Baptist Church, same thing. Uh, my friend Peyton Hill up at uh, First Baptist Prattville, same thing. I mean, my brother-in-law, Jason Britt over at Bethlehem Church, Sean Lovejoy, who was yeah. here a few weeks ago, Mike Lynch at North Star Church, Carrick Thomas at The Journey, Nelson Searcy at The Journey. Like th- these, the, the men that I let speak into my life, everything I said about how I view it, they view it the same way. Right. So, um, you know, it's not like I'm the only one out there doing that. <laughs> right. you know? right. and, and we're fortunate here in our community, there's lots of really good men of God who are faithfully preaching God's Word. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, let me ask you this. Um, in a world that's so hostile to our beliefs, how do we stay true to those beliefs and love those that are hostile to us? Isn't it amazing that people were drawn to Jesus? Mm-hmm. People were drawn to Jesus that didn't believe anything like Jesus. Right. I mean, Zacchaeus, who was a wee little man, he climbed <laughs> way up in that sycamore tree. Why? For the Lord he wanted to see. Right? Right. If you if you really understand what was going on in Zacchaeus' life, it, 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 not not good. Right. Okay? Yeah. okay, But he's drawn <laughs> to Jesus. It's amazing to me that Jesus' beliefs never kept people from him. Mm-hmm. It in some way, he was constantly drawing them to him. Yeah. So, you know, we lead with love. We lead with love. You know, so my beliefs should never be the reason why I don't love someone. Mm-hmm. Right. That's actually incongruent with right. the New right. Testament, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I believe what I believe. But, okay, how long of a process was that to get to that place? Mm-hmm. 
the journey of faith is a process. Right. Someone who you, they expect someone to start believing like me, why? Why should they believe like me? Yeah. I mean, so my call on uh, on their life is to love them, mm-hmm. right. show them the love of Christ. Do that well in time, maybe there's conversations. Right. There's an opportunity. You know, so we, we've got to love people enough to love them just the way they are. It's exactly what Jesus said. It's right. the him I sang growing yeah. up as a kid, right. just as I am. Yeah. So yeah. guess what? That applies to us. Yeah. Just just as I am coming to the Lord, but just as he is coming to me, just right. as she is coming to me. We right. accept people right where they are. We meet yeah. them where they're at. Do you think people confuse loving with agreeing? So yeah. like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I think that's the issue is they yeah. think, well, if, if you love me, you'll agree 100% with the way that I think. And that's not yeah, always that's the case. Not, yeah, like that's not. I mean. I don't want to speak out of turn here. I don't want to presume on y'all's marriages, but my wife and I don't agree on everything. Okay, yeah, yeah. that's correct. So yeah. the idea that love is synonymous with agreement. Yeah. That, yeah. Since when? Right. You know. So um, you, you know, you love somebody, and then there can be a variety of ways to look at different things. Yeah. And we yeah. can respectfully agree to disagree. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But you've got to. We don't get to decide what another person believes. Right. We mm-hmm. get to decide how much love we show that person. Yeah. And again, right. I can only lead my friends to faith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if you don't build a relationship with somebody, you don't have the opportunity to lead them to Jesus. That's the ultimate goal. The goal isn't to win an argument. The goal right. isn't to be right. right. The yeah. goal right. is to lead yeah. them to Jesus. Right. So yeah. we've got to love that person enough. Here's the key to give up the right to be right. Mm. I'll give up the right to be right because I want to love you enough to lead you to Jesus. Right. And and that's what we've been called to do. Hmm. Yeah. You know, one of the things you said, I want to touch on this. You said that part of the problem with taking verses out of context is it's resulted in kind of a repressive attitude many times towards women and the gifts that they've been given by the Holy Spirit. So how can we do a better job of not doing that, of encouraging women and helping empower women uh, to use the gifts that the Holy Spirit has given them? Well, structure a church that allows that, mm-hmm. and we have. You know, gratefully here at Vaughn Force Church, we follow the biblical model as it's, as it's laid out in the New Testament, and women can do anything here. Mm-hmm. The only thing in the New Testament that it says is reserved for a man is the role of pastor or the role of elder, okay? Now, let's get real clear on that, not to sound, you know, other anything other than just stating facts. Sure. Like, that's my position. Right. Like, student pastors aren't mentioned in, in the Bible. Right. Executive right. pastors of ministries aren't mentioned in the Bible. Right. Worship pastors aren't mentioned in the New Testament. You can make a pretty good argument from the Old Testament, the yeah. role of the song leader when it comes yeah. to psalms and different things like that, okay? So once we establish that, then every other role slash office in the church is available for a man or a woman, mm-hmm. Right. okay? So at Vaughn Forest, that's the case. You know, Vaughn Forest Church would never have a woman as their lead pastor because we believe that's what Scripture says. Again, that's one of the things like, well, why is that? Well, it's in there. So, right. you know, we're just going <laughs> to accept it. We're going right. to submit ourselves to it. But what's happened is that has then served as a basis to not let women do a whole lot of other things that they should have been doing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and yeah. a lot of that's just insecurity. A lot of that's fear. A lot of that's control. But I mean, if we sit in a meeting, three or four men, and we talk about things, we can reach some good conclusions. If we bring a woman into the conversation, we can reach some great conclusions. Right. Mm-hmm. That's what's happened in a lot of churches is the fact that a woman hasn't had a seat at the table has led the churches to making really dumb decisions when a woman could have really helped. I mean, we know this just being married. How many times have our wives spoken words of life or right. words of wisdom? And we're like, wow, I never yeah. even saw it that because way. Because she's <laughs> listening all the time. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, you yeah, know, God sure. created us differently and yeah. those differences are meant to complement yeah. one another. Yeah, that's Sometimes right. in a church, we never even give that option a chance. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's all I'm trying to say. And here at Vaughn Forest, if you're a woman, just know, like there, there, there are no, what are the glass ceilings around here. Right. You just do anything you want that God's called you to and gifted you to. Now right. we have a process just like we do for everything. I mean, you can't go up to Matt next Sunday and go, I'm singing today. Like it doesn't work that way, <laughs> right. you know, but, but so there's a process to things, but, but we celebrate women using their gifts. Yeah. <clears throat> so you said that the issue being addressed by Paul in Colossians three was in context of the household. Um, help me on understand that. What, like, can you unpack that a little bit for us? Yeah, I tried to in the message, but, you know, if they've got slaves, they're living in the same living quarters, household, Mm -hmm. uh, compound, if you will. So the idea there, the principle is when you become a follower of Jesus, it affects all of your relationships. Mm -hmm. Okay. I didn't say this in the sermon because, again, it would require too much clarification. 
a slave and master is not the same as an employee and a boss. Right. And mm-hmm. if anybody tries to draw that correlation, it's just not. Yeah. It's not there, okay? <laughs> it's not there. You're reaching. It's not there. <laughs> but let's step outside of the passage for a second. If you happen to be an employer of mm-hmm. people in today's world and you're a Christ follower, your relationship with Jesus should affect the way you treat your employees. That's right. right. Yeah. If you are an employee and you have a boss, your relationship with Jesus affects the way you treat your boss. So you can't be a Christian boss who is, a, a, you know, let's say uh, loves their spouse, loves their kids, loves Christians at church, but is a jerk of a boss to their employees. Mm-hmm. No, no. The principle there is it affects all all human relationships. We don't right. get to reserve certain roles and go, well, I'm just not going to let it apply to that. Right. And that's really the greater principle that Paul's going after with that passage. Mm, yeah. That's really good. So you ended the message talking, uh, you gave us two kind of kind of practical points. You said, be careful and be compassionate. What does that look like for us practically in our everyday life? I mean, somebody does something sinful, um, completely counter to God's word, they're dealing with the consequences of their sin, and they say, well, I'm good because God works all things together for the good to those who love him. No, no. <laughs> you're, you're dealing with the consequences of your sin. Mm-hmm. You know, someone decides to completely walk counter to God's word. Um, they do their own thing. They, you know, rebel against all authority in their life. They find themselves in a place, and they say, well, I know the plans the Lord has for you, plans to prosper you. And, <laughs> no. <laughs> so what what happens is so many times like we land ourselves in a mess mm-hmm. and then we want to pick and choose a verse and go, okay, God, I need you. I need you now. <laughs> right, right. Now right. it's your turn. It's your turn <laughs> to make this verse my reality. Right. Right. It doesn't work that way. Mm. Don't work that way. So, you know, there's a book in the Bible that's amazing called Proverbs. Mm-hmm. And what Proverbs is basically saying is for the most part, here's how life goes. Mm. So read through Proverbs and let it guide you. Let it speak to you. There's repercussions and consequences for our actions and our choices. When we make stupid choices, if we're followers of Jesus, we've talked about this a lot. It doesn't throw off our relationship with God. Mm-hmm. But there are major repercussions and consequences with the other relationships in our lives. Yeah, Does absolutely. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, yeah, practically speaking, you know— don't think you can just go through life doing whatever you want and then play the God card when you need it. There's a lot in God's word that speaks <laughs> completely against that. Right, right. You know, when you counsel your children, you know, we had a really long conversation this weekend in my home over something that most brave, most people, unless they're Braves fans, wouldn't be having a conversation about. But it was the return of Freddie Freeman, Freeman to yeah. the Atlanta Braves <laughs> yeah. and, and all the things. And Son, it's okay to cry when you see him. Yeah. I have yeah. my own commentary on what's really going on in that situation. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, boy. Yeah. I don't want to get controversial, so I won't share that on the podcast. Sure. We'll but I did, podcast. I did share it with my boys. Yeah. And we had a really long discussion, both Morgan and me, with them about something that has no bearing on their life right now, Mm -hmm. but will eventually. And it had a lot to do with the person they choose to marry one day. Hmm. So this idea that you just kind of marry whoever you want, faith's not really a big deal, and, you know, (laughs) okay. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So you want to get practical about it. Just be really careful. Just be careful. Like, you can't just go through life doing whatever you want. You can't talk to people however you want. You right. can't show up to work late every day. You can't, you can't just do all this stuff right. and not expect there to be, right. you know, you can't just run yeah. up credit card bills. That, that Be right. careful. <laughs> right. that, but what we do a lot of times in the church is like we, 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 we create a faith that empowers people to just live however the heck they want. And then when they deal with that, Go find a verse, claim it, name it, claim it, fame it, whatever. And then if it doesn't work out, well, now it's God's fault. Right. <laughs> you know, so th- that's all I'm trying to be very, very careful yeah. with how you handle God's word and your submission when it comes to God's word. Yeah. If, if you see something in the Bible and you're like, I just don't like that at all. And you skim pr- past that. Be really careful. Mm -hmm. You know, we're called to submit ourselves to the hard teachings of God's word, the things that we don't agree with. If you only submit yourself to the parts of the Bible you agree with, you've become God. Mm. You are your own God. Mm. So it's only when you submit yourselves to the things that you don't agree with that you are declaring there's a greater authority in my life than me. That's what I meant by be careful. Now, when it comes to being compassionate, 
<clears throat> lots of people have been hurt. Guy stopped me in the lobby right after the service. He said, man, I appreciate what you said today. He said, you know, that 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 was really helpful for some of the things we've walked through in the past. I said, wow. man, I'm glad to hear that. I said, I've walked through some stuff too. You know, right. maybe we should grab lunch sometime. We can switch, you know, share stories. But, you know, there's been a lot of people who have been hurt yeah. by people who acted like they were representing God. And it can be difficult sometimes to separate the teachings of Jesus and what God's Word says from the people who have misrepresented Jesus mm. and what God's Word says. Right. But there comes a point in all of our lives where we have to grow up and do that. Right. And I'm just I'm just shooting everybody straight. Everybody's like, if you have not been hurt by the church, here's all that tells me. You haven't been in church very long. Yeah. The right. church is made yeah. up of a bunch of messed up people who are going to get it wrong. They're not always going to get it right. In the church, there's only one guy with a white hat. His name's Jesus. The rest of us are riding around horses with black hats. All right. So that's how <laughs> this works. One hero in the story. Right. The rest of us get it wrong more times than we get it right. right. Okay. Yeah. So if you've been hurt, I hear you. But don't let that keep you from all that God has for you. Mm-hmm. Now, for those of us who encounter people who are hurt, be compassionate. Yeah. Be compassionate, be loving, be understanding, uh, show grace. Um, don't just expect somebody to quote unquote, get over it. Even though I'm challenging people to get over it. There's a process to helping people get over stuff. Does that make sense? So we got to be compassionate with people. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely. Let's clarify just real quick. You talked about being hurt by the church. So like, obviously, you know, believers are going to hurt one another. There's a difference between that versus people that have been abused and all that kind of stuff. I I, want to make an important distinction there with what you're saying. Yeah. Well, I would say the principle holds true in both categories. Mm. You know, abuse, as, as as terrible as it is, does not take away the truth of God's Word. It doesn't right. remove... People are not that powerful. Right. Mm. Whatever hurt someone has brought into your life, that person is not powerful enough to supplant Jesus on his throne right. or Jesus as the authority in your life. Right. Yeah. So the, the spectrum of hurt is quite immense. That's right. So yeah, there are people who have experienced legitimate abuse, and I would encourage those folks to see a therapist and right. have somebody walk you through that. Right. And you mentioned our care at VaughnForest.com. Yeah, we'll right. be glad to help you with And that. it may be a long time until you're at a place where you're ready to trust again, and right. that's okay. Yeah. But as long as you hold out on the forgiveness uh, towards your abuser, it will ultimately eat you up from mm. inside. That's right. Now, there's other individuals who what they have claimed as a massive amount of hurt was really them just not getting their way. Right. Okay. That's right. So, you know, right. have a little bit of, you know, there are people who really have been hurt. Does right. that make sense? That's right. So I'm glad you said that. But, you know, if even if someone has hurt you, you still are called to forgive them and not then let that become the reason you don't experience the blessings of God in your life. That's right. What greater strategy could the enemy have? That's right. right. That's like a double whammy. Yeah. You go through the hurt and then you miss out on the future fruit fruitfulness because of that yeah, past yeah, hurt. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. Well, this has been a good conversation, gentlemen. I mean, it's kind of a you know, a couple of tough yeah, topics hard, that we're talking heavy. about today, but I really, I'm grateful that we can have these conversations. I'm grateful that in our church, we can get up and talk about these things and have these honest conversations, talk about what God's word has to say about it. So uh, thank you so much for sharing with us today. I've, yeah. I've really, you know, I enjoyed uh, this conversation. Looking forward to picking up in our implication series again this Sunday. And so we hope folks will come out and join us. If for some reason you're traveling, 9 30 to 11 o'clock online, fallenforce.com, mm-hmm. our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, uh, all that kind of stuff. So we hope you'll be a part of that. So I think that's going to wrap it up for us today. Adam, thanks again for sharing with us. Thanks, On behalf man. of Adam Bishop, Matt Collins, and myself, we appreciate you joining us, and we will catch you next time. Mm-hmm.